Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. And uh, we're going to look uh, this morning at verses 28 and 29. Uh, you know, they tell me that the average person who weighs 150 pounds uh, really is made up uh, primarily of water. A 150-pound person, if you extracted uh, the water from that person's body, you'd wind up with about 12 gallons of water. 150 pounds, that's about my size, about 12, 12 gallons of water. When you look at the words of Jesus on the cross, most of what he said could only be said as God. Today, uh, what we're going to be looking at, anybody can say. Uh, anybody can say, I am thirsty. Not many can say, not anybody can say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Not anybody can say, except God, today you will be with me in paradise. But all of us in the room have at one time or another said, uh, I am thirsty. Now, there's so many other things that are involved uh, in this saying, rather than the fact that he was physically thirsty. He's been hanging now on the cross for about six hours. He started on him about nine o'clock that morning. And he's been hanging there now. It's almost three o'clock in the afternoon. And the last three sayings of Jesus on the cross occurred in the final seconds of his life, just before uh, he died. Pick it up in verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, says, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they uh, filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. If you go over to Mark chapter 15, you'll find that these same soldiers... Uh, offered to give him a drink, and he refused it. Uh, he said, no, I don't want it. They offered him myrrh. Myrrh uh, was a painkiller. Uh, myrrh was uh, uh, something that would cause him maybe possibly to even lose consciousness. And he said, no, I'm here to experience every bit of this. Uh, I don't want it to dull my senses at all. Uh, I want to have to experience every sensation and every pain. I don't need the narcotics. Now, uh, these soldiers really weren't being compassionate. Uh, they didn't care about his pain. They didn't care about uh, what he was about to experience. What they uh, wanted to do was to shut up the screams and the rants uh, that they would have to listen to to someone that is... Uh, being tortured through uh, the capital punishment of crucifixion. And so they were offering the myrrh not for any kind of compassion toward him, but uh, they just were trying to keep from having to listen to all that came from the cross. But Jesus says no. Our uh, theological position is that Jesus died for the sins of the world on Calvary's cross, he descended to the lower parts of the earth. He went into hell itself to take the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And he arose from the dead three days later. But I contend with you, ladies and gentlemen, that while he was there on the cross, he took the judgment of all mankind. He took the punishment for your sins and mine. He took every sin, every evil, every murder, every adultery, uh, all compressed on him uh, on that cross. He took your hell so you wouldn't have to go there on Calvary's cross. One of the cries that will be evolving from hell throughout eternity is the same words that you're going to hear this morning is, I thirst, I'm thirsty, but there is no water in hell. I sure am glad for that clear crystal river of water that 
flows in glory, aren't you? Now, we don't have any word up to this point about the personal pain that Jesus went through on the cross. I'll remind you that he hasn't had any sleep now all night long. He's gone through six trials all night long. The soldiers beat him beyond recognition. They took a cat of nine tails, which is nine pieces of leather with bone and glass and rock tied to the end of those laces, and they scourged him 40 lashes, leaving 360 different wounds across his body that left most dead when they were finished the scourging. They put a crown of thorns on his head, which produced more blood fold than you can imagine as it flowed down his face. They stuck a spear uh, in his side and crucified him. And yet, we haven't heard a word of personal pain yet until we get to the section that we're in this morning when the Lord Jesus cried out, I thirst, I am thirsty. No water all night. No water all day, the closing seconds of his life. And he says, I am thirsty. Now, it's more than just the personal pain of being thirsty that's here. There's a lot more that is implied. The first thing that I want you to see with me uh, here this morning is that you realize he's a person. You realize his humanity. Uh, folks, now, God was not half God and half man. He was 100% man. He was fully God. He was the God man. And it's just as important. Listen, listen. It is just as important for us to say that Jesus is a man as it is for us to say that Jesus is God. Philippians chapter 2 the Bible says, but he gave up his place with God and made himself nothing. He was born as a man and became like a servant. And when he was living as a man, he humbled himself and was fully obedient to God. Even his death, the death on the cross. And the writer, John the Apostle, is saying, I know what he said. I was there. I heard every word that came out of his mouth and when he spoke, I am thirsty. He was revealing himself as a man. John was combating what is called docetism and uh, the word docet means appearance and there was the teaching and doctrine from the docets that uh, uh, Jesus just appeared. That's what the word docet means. Jesus just appeared as a man. He really wasn't a man, but just gave the appearance of a man. And John is combating that teaching. Now, we don't have docetism in this day, but we do have uh, Islam. And Islam says that God would have never taken on the form of a man. God would have never died on a cross. The disciples just stole away his body and put a substitute in. That's who it was that died on that cross. It wasn't. God. It wasn't Jesus. But Jesus' thirst was real. And ladies and gentlemen, it is as wrong today to deny the humanity of Jesus as it is to deny his deity. He is fully God and fully man. It reveals his person. Uh, second, it reveals prophecy. Now notice what the Bible says uh, here in the passage that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Over and over and over again, through the word of God, God says to the nation of Israel, be on the lookout, I am sending the Messiah. And when you see this happen, you will know it's him. And when you see this happen, you will know it's him. And when you see this happen, you will know it's him. About 380 times in the Old Testament, God says to the nation of Israel, Keep on the lookout for this one. I wonder what the odds were 
that all of the prophecies in the Old Testament were fulfilled in one man. Prophecies such as he will be born in Bethlehem, he will spend time in Egypt, he will be raised in Nazareth, he will raise the dead, he will die on an old rugged cross after having been falsely accused, said they be innocent and yet crucified. And by the way, the crucifixion prophecy uh, was given a thousand years before the method of crucifixion was ever developed. But he would be crucified. He, he would hang there on that cross. Then the final prophecy that was to be fulfilled, uh, the psalmist said in chapter 69 and verse 21, that gave me vinegar to drink. Jesus said, I thirst. The soldiers reached over, picked up a hyssop weed with a sponge on the end of it, and they dipped it into a substance called Pascha. Pascha was soured wine uh, that the common man could afford. The common man couldn't afford good wine, and so this soured wine would be mixed with water, and it was very inexpensive and very cheap, and very affordable, and they brought a jug with them out there uh, to the crucifixion scene, and they took a hyssop weed, and they dipped it into the pascha, and they put it to the lips of Jesus. 400 years, the nation of Israel was in Egyptian bondage. God sends Moses along. Moses goes to uh, Pharaoh, and he says to Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh, through a series of God hardening his heart and hardening his heart through 10 different plagues that attacked the 10 different things that the nation of Egypt worshiped. They worshiped frogs, they worshiped cows, they worshiped the Nile River, they worshiped the firstborn. And God comes and he says, uh, there's gonna be a spirit come over the land that will kill the firstborn of every family. And to the Jew, he said to the Jew, uh, go get you a lamb that is spotless, without blemish, shed that blood, take a hyssop weed and dip it into the blood and put it on the doorpost and the lintel of the house and when I see the blood, I will pass over. There's the word, pass over you. And so when they dip that hyssop into the vinegar-like substance and they lifted it up, every good Jew would have realized and known that is the Messiah. That is the sacrificial lamb. That is the one who is shedding his blood for the sins of mankind. So when he said, I am thirsty, he revealed his humanity or his personhood, and he then exposed prophecy that was being fulfilled before them. Third, it radiated passion for you and for me. He showed what he was willing to do. He showed the extent that he was willing to go so that you and I could be forgiven of all of our sins so that you and I could have the assurance that when we die, we are going to get to go to heaven. Uh, that's what he was doing. I wonder, have you ever been thirsty for someone else's benefit. Back in 1969, early 19, well, actually it was in the summer of 1969, I was in Fort McClellan, Alabama. It was 105 degrees in the midst of the summer. We were scheduled for a force march, full pack, up this very, very steep high mountain right outside the city. As we were going, we came across a brush fire that we had to put out in full gear. Blazing hot, sweat, nasty, smoke-filled lungs. We started up that mountain. Got about halfway up the mountain, and one of the guys in our company fell out. Eyes rolled back in his head. The Drill sergeant was there and he said, Winston, give me your canteen. Had about that much left. 
I knew we had a long way to go. And I knew that that could be me next. I prayed about it. <laughs> Gave him my canteen, and I don't know that I've ever been as thirsty in my life as I was when I got to the precipice of that mountain. Have you ever been thirsty for the benefit of somebody else? Romans chapter 5, the Bible says that God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ was thirsty for us. Christ died for us. I read one of the most interesting articles this week. I've read in a very long time on August the 16th, 19. Uh, 87, flight 225 out of Detroit, Northwest Airlines uh, left Detroit and moments later, 155 people on board that flight, moments later, it crashed, killing 154. One four-year-old little girl by the name of Cecilia survived the crash. She survived because her mama had taken off her own seatbelt and she had engulfed her four-year-old daughter, wrapped her arms and her legs and completely surrounded her with her own body. And that little four-year-old girl survived. She's in her mid-30s now. And she survived that crash because mama protected her from death. You understand that that's what the redemptive love of Jesus did for you and for me. He surrounded us with his love and he protected us and took our judgment upon himself. He was radiating with the passion when he said, I thirst, it was for you and it was for me. Soldier reaches over and he gets that hyssop. Can you imagine, can, can you imagine this? Can you imagine being the soldier that moistened the lips of Jesus? Jesus still had a couple more things he wanted to say. His lips were parched. His throat was crackling. And he had something else he had to say. He was thirsty. I, I can't imagine the pleasure, the benefit, the privilege of being that soldier. I can't help Jesus on the cross anymore. But what I can do is do what Jesus said, when you've done it unto one of the least of these, you have done it unto me. Uh, Amos chapter 8 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, and I believe that this is where we are right now. I believe this is a graphic description of what's going on in our country. I believe it is a detailed look at the young generation that is coming up before us right now. He says, not a famine of bread or thirst of water, but a hearing of the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and they shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men Faint for thirst. Uh, you, you understand people today look good on the outside. Boy, we've got some of the greatest fashions uh, that history has ever known. People uh, look good. My wife is telling me about some new shoe that everybody's been. What's the name of that thing? Oh, what? What is it? Hey, dude. Y'all know about hey, dude shoes? Never heard of it before in my born days. We, we got all kinds of fashion today. People are looking good on the outside, but on the inside they're falling apart. And they're going from one thing to the other, trying to find satisfaction, trying to find fulfillment. And they're looking in all of the wrong places, looking in the wrong faces. God says there'll be a famine in the land. People looking for something, but they're looking for the wrong things to quench their thirst. Now, if that's true, and it is, 
What is the church's responsibility? What is your responsibility? What is mine? I, I believe with all of my heart that we serve him by serving others. I quoted a little verse a moment ago. Listen to this. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, this is in Matthew 25, verse 37, when saw we thee hungry and fed thee or thirsty and gave you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger take you in or naked and clothe you or when did we see you sick or in prison and came to you and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Here, here's an amazing thing. This is astonishing to me. Here is creator God hanging on that cross saying, I'm thirsty. You ever thought about the fact that he's the one that created water? Every drop of H2O came as a result of his creative genius, his creative power. He could have easily satisfied his own needs there on the cross, but there in the midst of it, he said, I need some human assistance. I want somebody to help me. You ever look across our world today? Maybe you've made statements like this and you see everything that is wrong, you need to see everything that needs to be fixed, you see every disease and every malady and every deficiency, and maybe in the midst of your prayer, you've even said, God, why don't you do something? And could it very well be that God responds? I'm asking you the same question. Why don't you do something? Every time that you look around and you see a need that is around you, God is saying, here's your opportunity. Here's your chance. Here's the occasion. So we serve him by serving others. And God notices even the very smallest of acts of service. Even says that if you give a cup of cold water in his name, you'll be rewarded. God taught a preacher friend of mine a lesson recently that I thought was uh, intriguing. We were, I was going up the road, preach revival. I got him on my heart, called him on the phone, just talked to him, and he, he got to telling me about having been on a little spiritual sabbatical for about three days. And he'd always had a desire to preach to large numbers of people, to pastor a big church. And he doesn't pastor, never has pastored a big church. But he went on to tell me about what God had dealt with him about in those three days of isolation and just being alone with God. When you are faithful in the little things, you'll automatically be faithful in the big things. But if you're unfaithful in those little things that come along your way, how can God trust you with the big stuff? God notices the little things. Just a cup of cold water. I want to ask you a question this morning. I almost did this. I almost brought with me uh, little Dixie cups. And I was just going to give a, everybody in the room a little Dixie cup this morning. And say, uh, why don't you take that little Dixie cup and put it in a prominent place somewhere in your home to remind you that just a cup of cold water in Jesus' name makes a difference in the kingdom of God. I want, what are you willing to do to see somebody go to heaven? Doug Nichols was a missionary a number of years ago to Calcutta, India. He couldn't speak the language, but he was there to try to win as many people as he could to Jesus. He developed tuberculosis and wound up in a sanatorium for a number of years. So he's there in that sanatorium and although couldn't speak the language, he had uh, little tracts and booklets uh, that led people to Jesus. He passed them out everywhere, but nobody would receive them. Nobody would take them. They would say, no, we don't want them. One night he woke up and there was this little frail man, elderly guy, just hardly skin and bones, had tuberculosis, probably didn't have long to live. And, and, and he tried to get up out of his bed and he'd get up onto the side of the bed and he would try to stand up only to fall back. Didn't have enough strength. He'd try to stand up and fall back into the bed. And over and over he did it. 
The next morning, the stench in the room was almost unbearable. The doctors and nurses were so angry at that man for messing up his bed. One of the nurses even slapped him out of anger for what he had done. They finally cleaned him up. The very next night, the missionary wakes up again, and there's that old boy, and he's trying to stand up, and he's falling back, and he's standing up and falling back. He gets up out of his bed, goes over to the frail little body, helped him go to the bathroom, helped him clean up, and then brought him back to bed. The next morning, one of the patients came by the missionary's bed and motioned, I, I want one of those tracts, I want one of those books. Did, couldn't tell him, but he made the motions, gave him a tract. A little while later, somebody else came for one. A little while later, somebody else came for one. A little while later, somebody else, a doctor and a nurse. And a few weeks later, uh, one of the missionary's pastor friends came by and said to him, and he could speak the language, and he said to the missionary, he says, you will not believe how many people have been saved as a result of what you did and those little booklets that you've passed out. Let, let me ask you, what are you willing to do? What are you willing to do? What are you willing to do to see somebody in heaven because of you? The third thing I want to share with you is that the most Christ-like service you'll ever do is to your enemies. The psalmist said in uh, no, excuse me, the wisdom writer in Proverbs 25 says, if your enemies are hungry, give them food to eat. If they're thirsty, give them water to drink. Even if you don't agree with their lifestyle, even if you don't agree with their politics, even if they don't like you, we're, we're to show the love of Jesus. We're to extend the grace of God to them. Uh, I had to practice this before I preached it. Two nights ago, we were out of town to a uh, family funeral that was yesterday, and we stayed at a Marriott down in Greenville, South Carolina. And I want to tell you, it was one of the most miserable nights I think I've ever spent in a hotel. The people, we had a connecting room, and of course those doors are real thin, and the people next door to us were so insensitive uh, all night long, it seemed, uh, television blaring like a party going on. The doors were slamming over and over and over again. And I put a pedal over my head. The next morning, really early, I thought, okay. The Holy Spirit of God gripped my heart and says, you better be practicing what you're preaching. You know what you're going to tell those folks on Sunday morning about loving the enemies. And I promise you, it took all of the grace of God that I could hold to not slam that door when I went out. Huh? Let me give you a third one. When I see this, I thirst uh, not only do I see the impact of Jesus and not only do I see the responsibility that you and I have to other people, I, 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 I see some discoveries of our own spirituality uh, that is here. Maybe you're watching by live stream or television. Maybe you're here today and you're just sensing, I am so dissatisfied, I'm so unfulfilled, I'm so incomplete Well, if you're going to do something about it, you, know, you, you need to know three things. First of all, you've got to realize what you're thirsty for. Remember that now, okay? I've got to remember and realize what I am thirsty for. What you think that you really need is really not what you need at all. Somebody, if I can just get married... It'll fulfill me and bring me contentment. I wonder if anybody would like to speak to that for the next few minutes, huh? <laughs> so, some of you believe if I could just land that job, if I can just make a little bit more money, if I could just 
have me a boyfriend or a girlfriend, then I believe I would be happy. Not ultimately. You need to understand that absolutely no one can meet the needs of your life that God can meet. The Bible tells us in Psalm 63, 1, oh God, you're my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and a, a, a weary land where there's no water. I, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. You're just looking in the wrong places. You're looking at the wrong people. The Bible says, blessed are those who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they're the ones that are going to be satisfied and fulfilled. They're the ones that are going to be blessed. Can I just say to you, you, you just understand something. Only God can meet your needs. Believe you me, I spent 20 years trying to fill up this God-shaped vacuum in my heart with more stuff than you could ever imagine or I will ever tell you about. But it was only when I turned to Jesus that I find what I was looking for. The next thing I want you to hear is that Jesus understands your pain. You, 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 those of you that are in chronic pain right now, those of you that hurt all of the time. Those of you that are suffering physically, understand Jesus knows about your suffering. He understands your pain. He had 370 wounds in his body as he was hanging there on that cross. He knows how you feel. The emotional pain, Jesus knows what it's like to be forsaken. He knows what it's like to be rejected. He knows what it's like to be shunned. He knows your emotional pain. We have a Savior in glory who understands everything that you are going through or ever will go through. The, the, the next thing is, I, I would say to you, stop looking for contentment elsewhere. Uh, the Bible says, for my people, listen to this, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. God says the places that you are digging wells are not going to last. Many of you are digging wells of a job. God says it won't last. You're digging a well maybe in some sports activity. It won't last. Digging out wells that leak. When God says, I've got Niagara Falls right behind you, that I'll pour out more blessings on you, it would be like taking a thimble and putting it in a fire hydrant trying to get a, just a sip. That's what Jesus has for you. Can, can I kind of close with this? Um, anytime you put something in the place where God is supposed to be, uh, it's only going to make you more thirsty than you've ever been because sin is so addictive. Some of you are following a porn addiction right now and you realize that this, this porn, it, it just starts with uh, something that may even be almost innocent and then it progresses and gets worse and worse and you get more and more and more thirsty. Sin is progressively in its nature. Prescription drugs... The same thing. Anger is the same thing. Sin is never enough. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus answered, he's talking to the woman at the well over in Samaria. He said, whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinks of the water that I'll give him will never thirst, but the water I'll give him will be uh, in him a well of water springing up. It's an artesian well, if you will, springing up into everlasting life. How many of you under the sound of my voice, whether by live stream television or right here in this building, are you really dissatisfied with what's going on in your life now? How many of you are really discontented in life? 
How many of you are unfulfilled in life? You've tried everything. You've gone everywhere. You've looked at every place. But nothing seems to satisfy your life. Nothing will apart from an abiding, living relationship with Jesus Christ. He's the only one that will satisfy your soul. He's the only one that will bring contentment. Here's a beautiful thought. Jesus became thirsty so I would not have to be. And he's thirsty today for you to know him. He's thirsty today for you to have a relationship with him. He's thirsty today to satisfy the deepest longings of your life and heart. And I'm asking you today as your pastor, give up trying to satisfy those longings from the places that you've been looking. And finally, turn to Jesus and receive him into your heart and into your life. Would you stand with me and let's pray together? Father God, I want to just bless you and praise you for everybody that has come, everybody that has watched uh, through our live streaming today. I, I pray in your sweet name for every person that has never received you into their heart and into their life never been satisfied by your grace and goodness and mercy. May today be the day that they turn away from sin and say yes to you. Help us to draw near to you as you're drawing near to us. I pray for those people that once walked with you and knew you in your fullness, but they've slipped away some isolated themselves from you and God's people. I pray today for a renewed commitment. May they be reminded of what you did for them and loved them. And once again, renew their walk with you. Pray for those that are looking for a church home. Lord, would you uh, let them know that this is a place that they could serve you well move their membership here to First Baptist. Would you get glory right now in the remaining portion of this service through the changing of somebody's heart? Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.